Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for either coming down here to the Ragged today for the first in-person Wednesday seminar in a while or for joining us online. Um, obviously, we have a, a great talk lined up this morning. Um, before I get started, though, uh, I'm the chair of the seminar. For those who don't know me, uh, my name's Adam. Uh, I work in the onshore energy systems here, and I've been uh, lucky enough to be collaborating with our, our guest speaker today for a couple of years now on various projects. Um, so before I introduce him, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today, both in person or online. Um, so without any uh, further ado, um, this morning's seminar is the impact of diagenesis on rock properties uh, in shales. And our guest speaker is Dr. David Dewhurst from CSIRO. Uh, he's also this year's uh, AAPG Distinguished Lecturer. So we're pretty lucky to have him here today giving this talk. Um, Dr. Dewhurst, uh, or Dave as he likes to go by, was awarded a BSc with honours in geology from Sheffield University in the United Kingdom in 1987 and a PhD in physics from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne uh, in the United Kingdom as well in 91 for work on noble gas migration during rock deformation. From 92 to 98, he worked on fluid flow in mudrich overpressured accretionary complexes, the role of compaction and lithology on the physical properties of mudrocks and polygonal faulting in North Sea mudrocks. Dave joined CSIRO in 98 as a research scientist working on pore pressure prediction and fault top seal issues. From 2009 onwards, he led two consortia on both overburden and gas shales, investigating the links between geomechanics, rock physics and petrophysical properties. He's also worked on top fault seal properties and geomechanics for geological storage of CO2. He is currently a chief research scientist at CSIRO, leading the geomechanics and multi-physics group, as well as the CSIRO geomechanics and geophysics laboratory. Um, I'll uh, waste no more of your time uh, and introduce you to Dave. I'll, I'll get him to come up and uh, yeah, let him talk you through uh, the impact of diagenesis on rock properties in shales. All right. Well, thanks very much for that intro, Adam. I've no idea I've actually given you that amount of information to talk about. Um, so thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks to everyone uh, online as well. Uh, I'll try my best not to wander around. I tend to be a bit of a wanderer. Um, I'm told I have to sort of uh, stay pretty close to this microphone, so I'll try not to do it and please yell at me if I do. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to talk you through um, diagenesis and rock properties in basically gas shales here. I'm going to use a couple of examples, one from the Marcellus um, in the US and then one a bit closer to home um, in the Canning Basin. Um, looking at the Goldwire and Bongabini formations, which where we actually looked at them, they're not really um, uh, sort of gas shales, but in other parts of the basin they are. Okay, so just to, to kick off, uh, oh, are we, uh, oh, it worked so well before. Oh, seem to, do I go here? I certainly don't seem to have any movement here. It's going to move in a bit. 10 goes probably. That's well, not a touch screen either. Yep. I seem to be struggling a little bit here for have a quick look. It's just not going on. So I was on. Pull it like that, will it? OK, all right. So I just have to do it that way. All right. Oh, the wonders of technology. So, all right. OK. Um, so just to start off, I'd like to um, thank the AAPG and AAPG Foundation for um, you know, setting up the Distinguished Lecturer course and the AAPG Foundation for actually funding things to, to keep things nice and free, basically. Um, there's a whole bunch of other people up here, so Kitty Milliken who sponsored me and then a few of the other people from AAPG itself. Um, now, this work I'm going to present today, that certainly wasn't all done by me by any stretch of the imagination. It tends to be sort of a big collaborative effort, um, some of the multidisciplinary work that we do. And there's a whole bunch of colleagues on here um, who've all contributed to this work quite significantly. And then finally, um, a number of this, quite a bit of this work was done under the, the Shark 1 and Shark 2 shale consortia um, that Adam mentioned just a moment ago and sponsored by a number of these companies here. Okay. So to get into the science side of things, just to sort of set the scene a bit, 
Um, we're going to think about you know, what happens when we bury things, when we heat them up, and you know, what happens to the mineral phases, what happens to the organics. And this is just sort of a you know, bit of a reminder more than anything. So in, in terms of the, the mineral phases, um, we basically have um, mechanical compaction occurring, you know, maybe top kilometer, maybe a little bit more. Um, and eventually you get to a certain point where you can't really um, squish the pore sizes down anymore. And then chemical compaction begins to take over. Um, and that can involve sort of a change in clay mineralogy. It can uh, involve dissolution or precipitation of minerals, things like that. But what we do see um, as part of that is dewatering of clays, alignment of clays um, as we go down, and that can have impacts on things like the anisotropic properties of materials. So that can be velocity, that could be permeability, uh, whatever. Um, and then deeper down, we see the diagen diagenetic transformation. So we can see, for example, illitization of clays. So if we look at things like smectide illite, that's going to be around kick off about 60 degrees centigrade. And potentially there's things like kaolinite to illite as well, you know, deeper down um, when we get to sort of well over 100 degrees, more like 130 plus. Um, you also get high temperature polytypes of illite as well. Um, which are useful for us um, in uh, understanding the thermal history of uh, materials. And then you know, we have uh, cement precipitation, so things like quartz overgrowth, for example, or, or potentially calcite precipitation as well, and some of the other more calcareous rich gas shows. Okay, so microstructural effects that we see, we can see an increase in clay crystallinity, and you can use an approximate geothermometer for that, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit later on. Um, as I say, increase in preferred orientation. Um, and this leads to increases in strength and stiffness. So as we decrease the porosity, basically, we increase the strength and the stiffness of these materials. Um, now, generally, we're talking about porosity reduction, but you can also have you know, porosity enhancement, for example, dissolution of feldspars and, and things like that. And we, we see that, for example, in the, the Barney Creek formation um, in the Northern Territory. Uh, I'll make sure I get the right thing. OK, so in terms of um, organics, and I'm no expert in organic matter, so if I uh, commit any heresies, please forgive me. Um, but you know, in, ter in terms of the processes going on, um, we've basically got removal of functional groups in here. We, we eventually sort of uh, generate the oil. Uh, the oil eventually can crack through to gas and you get a total sort of reorganization of the uh, the organic structure, essentially. And this manifests itself in things like loss of fluorescence, increase in reflectance, and you do get a variation in spectroscopic response between different types uh, of organic matter uh, dependent on thermal maturity. OK, oh, seems to be working with the arrow now. OK, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to sort of illustrate the impact of diagenesis on rock properties through a couple of examples. And as I say, the, the first one will be uh, the Marcella Shale, um, which is um, you know, basically you know, a very large source of gas in the US. Um, so it's, you know, it's very thick and kind of rules of thumb for looking at gas shells like a certain thickness in the materials, certain amount of organic matter, etc., a certain brittleness, let's say, if you like. Um, so the, the thickness is quite important over the area. Um, it's a marine sediment uh, deposited um, in the Devonian. And this little um, circle we can see up here is, you know, we were looking at one particular well, um, and it's from that northeast corner of Pennsylvania. Okay, so in terms of thermal maturity, um, now I don't know how, how clearly you can see that, um, but the, the well was in this county here. Um, so uh, the, the vitronite reflectance values or contours that you can see here are equivalent vitronite reflectance, I should probably say. Um, that's four and that's 4.5 in there. So very, very high vitronite reflectance, so extremely um, organically mature. Um, so in, in this area, they talk about sort of a, a line of death somewhere down here. Once sort of vitronite reflectance gets above about three or 3.5 and then um, you know, they don't really find gas. But that turns out not always to be the case, in fact. But yeah, that's another story. OK, so unsurprisingly, for something that's so high in uh, vitronite, uh, sorry, so high in thermal maturity, um, we've got, you know, basically nothing left um, in terms of generative potential um, in the shale. Um, and yeah, that's no surprise. That's just, you know, absolutely normal. So just a little bit of context for this well. Um, it's drilled in the very overmature part of the Marcellus, as we've seen already from the uh, the equivalent vitronite reflectance information, um, but we, we did do some more uh, ourselves just to confirm that. And um, we've got high quality logs, good hole conditions, so you know, petrophysical uh, 
interpretation was reasonably easy, um, nothing too much to foul it up. Um, what we see in that are the velocities are very low in the high TOC zone, and that's not surprising, you know, basically um, that's a, a density effect. Um, but what we did find was that there was extremely low resistivity um, in, the, in that hot zone, the high TOC zone. Um, so it's around 150 metres thick. Um, we've got high TOC and high pyrite um, in that area. All right, so let's have a look at these logs um, just quickly. And I'll, I'll sort of point at this as we go through. So this sort of uh, area here where we've got the very high gamma is our hot zone. Uh, we've got a little bit of core um, floating around in this hot zone. Um, so moving on to track two here, um, this kind of purpley colour that comes up out here is the, the TOC from logs. Um, the green dots are TOC from lab measurements, and we can see that you know, they actually m match up surprisingly well. And over on the right hand side, the tan colour or the orange or whatever, that's pyrite content. And again, the pyrite content we can see is high um, in this hot zone. And again, the yellow dots are pyrite from the lab um, as opposed to the log, which is uh, uh, the tan. So coming on to the resistivity, and um, we see here that the resistivity drops significantly and drops to very, very low levels, you know, um, extremely low levels down here. So very, very conductive shales. Um, and this is a problem for, for petrophysics um, when you're trying to look at things like gas in place and things along those lines. And again, the velocity we can see drops down pretty significantly in this hot zone, although the VPVS ratio doesn't actually change very much. Um, so the main things we, we need to remember from this slide are we've got um, TOC between about three and seven percent and very high, uh, sorry, very low resistivity. Um, so what we wanted to understand then, um, so the, what the company wanted to have a look at is why this area was so conductive. So we started off on the petrophysical side of things looking at pyrite. So we've got a graph here of pyrite content from logs against the deep resistivity. Um, and the colours in here um, are basically coloured by TOC. So the, the cyan colours um, on, on the left are the, the high TOC and the low resistivity, and yellow on the right is the, is the, uh, uh, the lowest TOC, and then kind of the reds in between them are in the middle. So we can see there, that's pretty much a scattergun plot, um, that there's probably little relationship um, between um, pyrite and the resistivity. Um, but we do see a reasonable uh, relationship between the deep resistivity on the y-axis here and the density on the x-axis. And then just note that this, the axis numbers here are backwards here. I'm not saying that says anything about petrophysicists at all. I would never do that. Um, but uh, I have had people ask me about that before. So. Um, so down here, we've got the cyan again. So this is the high TOC down here, and that's basically got your lowest densities or whatever, as you would probably expect. So that's just a little bit from the logs to set the scene. Um, I'm actually looking at the rocks as well. Um, I know it's a bit heretical to look at rocks these days, um, but we ended up with about a three metre long slab section. Um, you couldn't do a lot with this in terms of rock properties because basically it is about, it's a very thin core, you know, maybe two or three inches across, and we've got about a quarter of it. Um, slabbed off, so there's you know there's not much we could do in terms of things like scowl or geomechanics or anything. But what we could do was look at things like um, the, the you know the composition, the organic matter, the thermal maturity, things along those lines, and then try and compare them to to what we see in the logs. So as I say, um, we've got black shales with pyrite nodules, very high equivalent vitrinite reflectances, and essentially post mature for gas generation. So having a quick look at the the mineralogy. So in black on the left here, um, we've got illite. So in red here, uh, sorry, black on the left here is quartz and red is illite. Um, so it seemed generally mainly illite and quartz rich, a little bit of calcite at the top. Um, the blue coming down here is albite. And then there's the purple on the right hand side here is pyrite. So in some cases we've got up to about 10% pyrite or close to 10% pyrite um, in some of, these, uh, some of these shale samples. And the TOC we measured ourselves as well, and that comes out between 3.4 and 6.9, which is very close to what we already knew um, from the, the logs we've seen before at 3 to 7%. So, so that was comforting that things were you know, sitting in the right ballpark. All right, so let's have a look at the microstructure of this thing. So in general, just sort of a, a broad shot of the, the microstructure. So these little platy things you can see in here are the illites. The um, we've got some quartz in here. It's got some nice straight edges on it, probably got overgrowths on it. Um, we've got calcite um, floating around, just a little bit of calcite in this example. This one's probably a, an all bite. We can see a little bit of cleavage on it. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of anisotropy there, a bit of alignment of the fabric that we can see. 
Um, but when we go in a bit closer, so this is a pyrite framboid here at the top. So we've got some clay, some clays around here with a bit of sort of intercrystalline porosity, a bit of organics down at the bottom here again with a little bit of porosity. But if we go into the pyrite framboid, we can see that the individual frams are actually surrounded by organic matter. And um, this is basically migrated organic matter, so it's bitumen. Um, and that organic matter also has uh, porosity in it. And um, we can go in a little further. So we can look again at things like quartz. Again, quartz with nice straight edges on here. We've got some bitumen um, in the holes and the bitumen is now porous. So what that tells us is that the, the quartz overgrowths were in place before the bitumen was in place. And then uh, the, the generation of gas potentially from this uh, bitumen resulted in the, the porosity in the in that material. And again, just another one just to back it up. So we've got quartz overgrowths. We've got sort of a clay pack in the top left corner here. You know, very porous organic matter throughout the material. OK, again, quartz overgrowths in place before the bitumen um, or before the uh, oil migrated and was then turned to bitumen. OK, so organic hosted and intercrystalline porosity. We can see here these are clays on the right hand side here. Um, we can see there's a little bit of porosity between those clays, and this is quartz that is basically um, recrystallized to sort of a microcrystalline quartz with just some little lots, little holes in it. Okay, so we've got some, a number of different types of porosity that we're, we're seeing in this material, um, and that's all through uh, scanning electron microscopy. So if we go to the um, transmission electron microscope, and what you're looking at here is an overall picture of a TEM foil. Now these things are really, really thin. Um, just a few tens of nanometers. What you're looking at here in dark grey, and um, that's the organic matter. Um, these uh, other crystals that you see here in white, these are basically all quartz crystals. OK, so we're going to go in and have a look at what's going on in this little red box down here. Um, and what we see here under TEM, as we can see the quartz here, we can see the, the organic matter. And um, this image here with the colors on um, is basically from using a technique called high angle annular dark field microscopy. And basically what that does, it's a bit like EDX for, you know, um, for SEM, that can give us some chemical information essentially. So we can see that the yellow here is silicon. So that's your quartz crystals here and then the red. Um, that's carbon, so that's your organic matter. So you know the, the the chemistry is telling us what we uh we pretty much knew anyway in terms of uh, uh, the composition of the material. And then what we're going to do now is go right into this organic matter here, and then have a look at the scale bar to start with. So 200 nanometers down here. This is all your organic matter here, and this is absolutely riddled with pores. It's just like a giant sponge, just waiting waiting to soak up all that gas or whatever if there wasn't. Uh, in this particular well. Um, so, you know, really, really porous organic matter down to the, the you know, the tiniest scales. You can see that's 200 nanometers, something like that's probably 20 nanometers. And we can see there's a heck of a lot of stuff small, much, much smaller than that. OK. So just summarizing what we saw in terms of porosity here, uh, we've got a lot of organic hosted porosity, you know, a certain amount of intercrystalline porosity, and then, you know, very rare intraparticle and dissolution uh, porosity. And that's reasonably consistent um, with what other people have worked on for in the Marcellus, um, albeit at much lower um, equivalent vitrolite reflectances to uh, what, what we're working at here. Now, one of the things we wanted to do, as well as understand the rock properties, um, which I will be coming back to in a moment, um, was understand the thermal maturity um, of this system. And you know, the, the thermal maturity basically governs how the rock properties get to where they were. Um, so we looked at a number of um, uh, different techniques. Um, so uh, illite crystallinity, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, the rock eval stuff I showed a little bit earlier. Um, and then talk about Raman spectroscopy and then these two at the bottom. So our energy, sorry, electron energy loss spectroscopy and high resolution transmission electron microscopy. And they can give us some information about the, the microstructure and the, uh, the, the temperatures that these rocks have seen. OK, so starting off um, with maturation um, and their effects on minerals, um, we're going to look at illite crystallinity to start with. So the, the degree of illite crystallinity basically tells you how deeply these rocks have been buried, okay, what temperatures they've been exposed to. And how they do that is by something called the Kubler index. And that's just a relatively simple measurement where you take your, your peak height or half your peak height, basically, and it's the, just the full width of the peak at half of that peak height. So this example here um, on the left um, is from a shallow diagenetic zone. So you know, you're up somewhere near the surface in the slop. 
Um, and basically there you've got quite a wide peak, you know, quite wide, quite broad or whatever. Now, if you come down sort of uh, much further down here, down sort of, uh, you know, not, not quite metamorphism, but you're getting down to quite uh, high temperatures sort of, you know, below, or sorry, above 200 degrees centigrade, you know, nice, really tight, you like peaks, so re really, really narrow. So that's got a low Kubler index, whereas the wide one has got a much higher Kubler index. Now, how we use that um, is in reference a little bit to this chart here. So if we, if we look at the numbers down the side here, we can see, just keep an eye on this uh, 0.4 here and 200 degrees centigrade approximately on, on that side, as that's basically where um, the Marcellus um, illite crystallinity lies. So we see basically around 0.37 plus or minus a bit, so probably somewhere above 200 degrees centigrade. So it's not giving you, you know, an exact number. It's not going to give you 205 plus or minus five. It's going to give you sort of a broad sort of range, um, you know, approximately where you've been. Okay, the second um, method we looked at was called Raman spectroscopy, and this is done on organic matter. And when we look at a, a Raman spectrum of uh, organic matter, we see something like this. We see what's called a D peak or a disordered peak, um, and we see what's called a G peak or a graphite peak. Okay, so these are ba basically quite characteristic um, of, uh, of organic matter. And what, how you can use those uh, basically is by comparison uh, to, to this sort of chart here. Now, these numbers are probably a little bit small to see, but on the bottom here, um, we're looking at about 165 plus or minus 30 degrees centigrade. Um, I think this is somewhere around 200. This one's somewhere around 300. Um, and then we go all the way up to about 600 here, which is obviously irrelevant for, for what we're looking at. Um, but if you keep an eye on this one that's around 300, you know, we've got quite a, a broad D peak that's begun to develop and a nice tight G peak, so the graphite peak, because um, that's exactly what we see in the Marcellus. So this is the Marcellus here. Um, so there's our broad D peak. There's a nice tight graphite peak. Um, it's taken on the organic matter. And what you can do is you can, uh, you can take these peaks and deconvolve them into multiple other peaks, so three or four other peaks down, down here. Um, and from that deconvolution, you end up with a temperature that comes out somewhere between 260 and 285 degrees centigrade approximately. Um, now, I'm not an expert on how that deconvolution uh, actually works, um, so uh, please don't ask me. Um, but, um, you know, it's consistent with some of the other uh, uh, information that we're getting. OK, so on to the third type um, of thermal maturity indicator, and this was the uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy. Now, what you what happens basically when you shoot electrons um, at a, a, a thin section or whatever thin sample, um, the electrons lose energy as they go through it, and the amount of loss energy is characteristic of the type of bonds that um, it's encountering. What you get basically is a spectrum that looks something like this. Um, you get what's called a little um, a pi star peak here what's called a sigma star peak here. Um, and the shapes of these peaks, again, are characteristic of the temperatures that these have been exposed to. So you now we're starting at 300 degrees centigrade here and then going up to like 2,700. So we're talking about lava up there and even hotter than that. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, but just keep your eye again on this 300 peak. So we've got sort of a beginning to develop pi star peak that's nice and tight and a broad uh, sigma star peak there. So when we look at the Marcellus um, and take sort of a few hundred eel spectra and average them, you know, we're getting exactly that. We're getting the nice sort of broad sigma star peak and beginning to develop type pi star peak. Um, so perhaps somewhere around 300 degrees centigrade that we've got to on these. And that is consistent again, basically with partially graphitic carbonaceous material, um, which again is what the uh, Raman was telling us. Okay, so. Um, if we come down to high resolution TEM now, so this this isn't telling us about thermal maturity per se. What this is showing us is the microstructure of the uh, the bitumen that's in there. And what we can see is some parts of this are, you know, don't show any ordering at all or whatever, but some parts we can see um, in here. You know, we can see there's some you know there's some sort of ordering, there's some sort of you know lines um, within the within there. We can see the scale bar here. That's five nanometers. So you know we're talking teeny tiny scale here. Um, so uh, in the high resolution TEM, but what you're seeing is that ordering. And if you do a cross section, for example, along A to B here, you get something that looks like this. So this is just sort of grayscale intensity up the side against distance. And you get something here with these regularly spaced peaks, which are spaced at uh, 0.335 nanometers. And three, that actually happens, or 3.35 angstroms happens to be the basal spacing of graphite. 
Okay, but you know what we know is we're not we've not got graphite per se because graphite shows up in organic petrology, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but we've got something that's like a proto-graphite, something that's starting to turn into graphite, something that um, you know, potentially has some form of electrical conductivity. So if we look at the, um, uh, the organic petrology here, um, you know, we can see we've got bitumen sort of um, in little uh, fractures here, you know, in the you know, easily visible scale. So we're looking at just over a quarter of a millimetre across here. Um, we've also got it disseminated very, very finely in the ground mass. And again, we can see that more here. We've got some bitumen associated with pyrites and really fine stuff going all the way through the ground mass here. And we can look at this at a range of scales, but I, you know, I'll just jump to the tiniest scale, so down to 500 nanometers here. And we can still see we've got organic matter in here. We've got organic matter along every little grain boundary. You know, we're talking things that, you know, just uh, tens of nanometers, if that. Um, wide, and we've got um, you know, essentially proto-graphitized bitumen um, right throughout there. So essentially what we've got is we've got bitumen has migrated through the original pore network, um, or sorry, oil has migrated through the original pore network of the material. Um, and then the deep burial, so equivalent to probably six, seven, eight kilometers perhaps, so we've seen up to, to 60 to 70 degrees centigrade, has basically turned that oil um, into bitumen and that has even, that's partially graphitized even, and then has become you know, essentially conductive. So, um, so the story with the Marcellus and you know how diagenesis has impacted on those rock properties is that we've gone very deep. You know, we've we've seen that this thing is over mature. Um, from the various uh, geothermometers that we've used, you know, we're somewhere in excess of 250 degrees centigrade probably. Um, the porosity was most abundant in the organic matter that we filled there. Uh, that we saw there, we saw organic matter in uh, skeletal porosity as well as grain boundaries, and that that, orga oh, that organic matter just shows some ordering inside it. Not completely, as I say, we don't have graphite itself, but we do have you know, something that appears to be a proto-graphite, and that appears to be controlling the electrical properties um, as it's you know, actually in the original pore network, so you can allow easy flow through the system, uh, easy flow of current through the system, I should say. Um, we also tried in the, the laboratory measuring these things um, you know, with dielectrics um, and the, their conductivity was extremely high and very similar to what we measured in the lab. So you know, essentially, you know, we, we think that uh, we've got a, a good story here. OK, so the second part of the talk um, will focus on the Canning Basin, uh, where we're looking at two contrasting shale formations. So the Gold Wire and the Bongabini formations, these are of Ordovician age. Um, they were formed in different envir environments. So the gold wire is basically a more open marine environment. Um, the Bongabini is a more sort of hypersaline environment, and we will see that in the uh, the, or the impacts of that in the uh, the images we're going to have a look at. Um, so these initial environments, you know, had a, an impact on the rock properties that we were trying to measure. So a little bit of context: uh, we're looking at a well called Sally May Two, which is right in the middle of the Canning Basin there. Um, so we're around about 1500 to 1700 meters depth, if I remember rightly. Um, these are X-ray CT scans of the core plugs um, that we use for geomechanical testing. We can see the Bongabini is fairly massive, maybe the odd lamination in there, but the gold wire is much more significantly laminated. And these are basically uh, silty laminations. Um, so silty laminations in bright and dark laminations are, are clay. Um, a little bit on the mineralogy. So the gold wire, illite rich. Um, so we've got 50, 56% illite in there. Quartz are the next most abundant and with a bit of calcite and felspar. Um, whereas the bongabini, again, quite a bit of illite in there, but this time we've got dolomite and anhydrite um, in there, which were precipitated early again with a bit of quartz and, and felspar. So you know, different um, initial mineralogies to start with. So what we're doing for imaging these things um, is you can collect um, a bunch of different um, let's say electrons and cathodoluminescence and whatever all together um, so we can take x-rays to look at elemental mapping and identify mineral phases for example um, we can use some for phase contrast imaging you can use the uh, the cl for looking at crystal zoning diagenetic relationships and, and things like that we collect those all together so i'm, I'm just going to show you some examples of that um, on the the gold wire and bongabini as we go through so starting off with the gold wire um, so these are backscattered, uh, um, backscattered um, images. Um, 
On the left hand side, we have uh, the gold wire in a, a silty lamination. On the right hand side, this is more clay rich, so we can see the clay rich parts are, are kind of floating in the clay. We've got more rigid grains floating in there and a little bit of particulate organic matter there. And in the, the, the more, uh, um, what you call the coarse grain parts and the coarser grain laminations, um, yeah, we can see things are a bit more locked together, for example. So looking at one of those, um, or looking at the, uh, the more locked together one there, the, the, the coarser grained lamination, this is an X-ray image. So basically you can determine the mineralogy out of these. This mineralogy um, is reasonably consistent um, with the XRD uh, that we get. And then we can go on to what's called a panchromatic uh, cathodoluminescence image, um, which basically acquires CL you know, across a range of uh, uh, different um, light wavelengths if you like from infrared to visible to ultraviolet and what we can then do with this um, is if you remember from uh, things like sem imaging um cathodoluminescence in the uh, orthogenic quartz is quite dark um, in the detrital quartz it's quite bright um, so what you've got here are two examples of the energy intensity uh, basically in detrital quartz here is low in uh, uh sorry in orthogenic quartz is low and detrital quartz is high and we can use that to look at where we've got high silica and low intensity um, to actually map uh, where the diagenetic quartz is in this material so diagenetic quartz here um, you know, we get sort of essentially what's an overgrowth map um, you know, for that part of the gold wire and it seemed reasonably sensible because all of the stuff we were looking at here is all around the grain boundaries so it's all like you know um, quartz overgrowths OK, so to have a look at the Bongabini, um, in contrast, um, basically we've got uh, quite a bit of anhydrite in there. We get these big clusters of anhydrite and um, we get some dolomite in there, which are some of these darker grains in here. And then the, the, the grain mass, which is very dark, um, that's basically your illite. Um, we can also have a look at the phase distributions um, you know, in comparison between the gold wire and Bongabini. So this is, the, again, the, one of the coarser laminations in the gold wire. So, you know, we, we pick up um, a lot of the, you know, the quartz and the feldspar here, whereas in the, the Bongabini, it's not so laminated and looks a bit like this all the way through. So we've got illite as give, sort of given all the red. And then I think it's quartz in the, in the, the cyan type colours. This is uh, your purple down here is the uh, anhydrite, et cetera, et cetera, the green as feldspars. Um, so there's, you know, there is quite a contrast in the in the fabrics between these two things. Um, and if we want to have a look at the, the quartz cement distributions, and this is sort of just going back to that gold wire picture. Um, so these, these are the intensities of the CL. So this is the, the, the maximum silica signal here. And then we take the low end of it to give us all this blue, the, the overgrowth map. And we can compare that with the Bongabini and we see very little blue um, at all in the Bongabini. So there's not much in the way of uh, quartz overgrowths in here. What we also had a look at because we were interested in anisotropy of the properties here was um, you know, trying to quantify the texture of these materials. OK, so we use something called X-ray texture goniometry. So this was done at, uh, oh, I was going to say Amstow, but it wasn't actually. No, this was um, this was done uh, by some colleagues for us at uh, ETH in Switzerland. And what you basically do is you take um, a, a bit of the, the material and it kind of rotates in an x-ray beam and then that x-ray beam gets deflected and then from those deflections you can essentially work out how strongly or weakly aligned um, for example the clay minerals are so what we looked at was the the illite basal spacing in these um, and what we see is the bongabini so they've got this um, multiples of a random dimension i think if i remember rightly at 2.5 in the bongabini and close to 5.8 um, in the gold wire. So essentially telling us that the gold wire is much, much more strongly aligned um, than the, the, the Bongabini is. And there's a number of reasons for that. When we come back to the, the sedimentary environment, for example, so the gold wire is deposited in open marine environment. So we've got burial and mechanical compaction, which allows the rotation of, of clay grains. Uh, and then the porosity is reduced later on by the quartz overgrowths. And um, when we compare that to the Bongabini, um, we've got the deposition in a low energy hypersaline environment, which allows early cementation. So we've got precipitation of dolomite and evaporite very early on. And then that prevents the rotation of clay minerals because you've got a rigid grain framework um, around those clay minerals. And so essentially the gold wire, we've got a strong alignment, a strong preferred orientation and the Bongabini um, is much weaker than that. So what are the effects then? So how, how do those effects manifest in the, the macroscopic properties um, of, uh, of these actual rocks? So what we did was some, some geomechanical testing. 
Um, and this is sort of a typical stress strain curve for um, something like a shale. And what we're looking at here is the strain in the material. So this is how much basically the material has been squished down um, as we apply a stress. So this is the stress going up this axis. And you get a linear part of this curve and then it bends over as it starts to you know, get fractures in it, you know, micro fractures that eventually coalesce into a microscopic fracture where it breaks. And then it comes down to a strength where it's kind of just sliding along the fracture that's been created. OK, now this uh, straight line bit here is what's called the elastic part of the curve, and that's where we measure things like Young's modulus um, and Poisson's ratio, the equivalent interval for strain. Um, and basically, you know, that's the, the gradient of that curve uh, gives you um, the, the Young's modulus. So if you have a look at the um, the stress strain curves, um, this is just one example um, of the gold wire and bongabini um, at relatively low stress. And um, we can see the, you know, the, the stress strain curves here for the gold wire, the stress strain curve for the bongabini is much steeper. Um, so the Young's modulus is taken over this interval here in green on the gold wire and in red um, on the bongabini. And we can see the numbers here for, for the Young's modulus basically are about 4.5 for the gold wire and about 7.6 for the bongabini. So the bongabini is much stiffer, um, as we might have expected from what we've seen in the microfabric. And also it's much stronger. So peak strength here is about you know, 8.8 .8 MPA and about 24.5 in the bongabini. So we see there that the, the geomechanical properties um, have been you know, qualitatively impacted by the uh, by the original depositional environment and the diagenesis that's followed from that. We can also see it in the rock physics results, for example. Um, so here we're looking at uh, velocity at, um, at the side. So P, uh, well, actually no, just velocity. Um, and then uh, stress along the bottom here. And we've got um, P wave velocity normal to bedding is this, this one in red here. Uh, P wave velocity parallel to bedding. Um, up there, we can see there's a huge difference. Okay, so these are significantly anisotropic in terms of wave velocity. And then these are two S waves, parallel and normal to bedding again, very, very big difference between them. Um, whereas the Bongabini, um, you know, much less strongly aligned fabric um, and not so much in the way of fractures either. There are some fractures in the gold one, which also impacts the anisotropy. Um, but the two, the two P waves are much closer together. The two S waves are much closer together. So again, you know, a very different um, response in terms of the velocity um, qualitatively uh, related to the fabric. So just to summarize that for the um, macroscopic measurements that we see, the Bongabini was stiffer and stronger than the gold wire at the same effective stress. Um, the elastic uh, wave velocities are, are, yeah, the stress sensitive. I didn't talk about that actually in, in, in this particular talk, but uh, they are more stress sensitive than the Bongabini, and that's because of the fractures that are in there. Um, we've got strong PNS wave anisotropy in the gold wire because of particle alignment and fractures, but negligible in the Bongabini because they're not there anywhere near so much. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a good qualitative agreement between the texture and the elastic properties. So just summing up from the, the Canning Basin then, um, we have uh, two shells that were analysed from different environments. Um, they've got the same post-depositional history as well in terms of stress and pretty much temperature. They're only from a, you know, 100 metres apart or so um, in the succession. But what we see is the difference in the orientation and the diagenetic cement distribution, which reflects the original, uh, sorry, original depositional environment that they were formed in. Um, and so that then impacts on things like the anisotropy, the strength and the stiffness, um, for example. And so I hope you know, I've managed to show you here that you know, the detailed microstructural investigations can actually help us interpret uh, what's going on um, in terms of the rock properties um, in these shales in the Canning Basin. So finally, just to wrap it up, just to summarise them. So we, we saw two examples, um, one from the Marcellus and then one from the Canning Basin. What we saw with the Marcellus, um, we've got high maturity um, led to uh, oil migration, formation of bitumen, and then that bitumen you know, turned into kind of a proto-graphite because um, we've gone to very, very high temperatures um, you know, above 250 degrees centigrade. Um, this results in a very low resistivity zone because that um, graphite or proto-graphite, if you like, is in the original pore network of the material. So it provides the connectivity you need to get a very low resistivity. And this kind of shows the impact basically of organic diagenesis, if you like, um, on rock properties. Um, looking at the mineral diagenesis side of things was the Canning Basin, where we've got two shales with the same compaction history, both with highlight but very different fabrics 
because of the because of those depositional environments and early diagenesis in the Bongavini, much later diagenesis in the Canning, and that impacted on the uh, the fabric development the strength and the velocity and isotropy. All right, um, that's me pretty much done. I'll just wrap up with a, a nice pretty poke photo, as lots of geologists are inclined to do. And uh, I'll just thank you all for coming. I'll just thank the AAPG quickly as well and the AAPG Foundation for um, enabling this distinguished lecture uh, fellowship scheme. So, all right, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Can happen sometimes. Cool. Uh, well, uh, thanks everyone, and thanks Dave. Um, I should have said beforehand. I did play something in the chat for those who are online. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to throw them in. Although I might need uh, Robert to point out how we can view them up on here. Um, but I noticed there were none in there at the moment. Has anyone got any questions in the audience, Carol? There's really nice uh, detailed studies and the, the insights into the, um, I suppose, the geological controls. Um, are really cool. Um, in terms of scaling um, your observations further, I'd like to take it from the micro scale to regional mapping. Um, can you provide any inferences from, say, for the Marcellus? Um, you know, could AEM or magnetolurics be then used to map out regions to this perspective? Um, have, have people used your results to kind of make those transitions into proxies? Sorry, just before I let Dave answer, just for those online, um, Carol's just asked about uh, some of the inferences of going from the, uh, the the micro scale to the regional. Yeah, so um, so what what we try and do with a lot of the work that we uh, that we do here is you know we kind of build up from the bottom you know up to log and seismic scale. So we haven't tried to go much further than that in terms of regional scale in terms of you know organic matter distributions and things like that. We to to be honest, we didn't have the people to do that. You know, just with the, with that sort of skill, essentially. Um, but you know, wh where we can, we try very hard um, to at least get the sort of lab to log correlation wherever we can. And you know, we pretty much insist on that with the sponsors when we're doing stuff with them. That you know, you need to give us stuff that you know we can do this, and that's what you're signing up for. So, so that's what we try and do. Um, so you know, going to the really big regional scale that I know you guys work at quite a lot. It's not sort of the thing that we do very regularly, sometimes, but not very often. Go on, Chris. Um, yes, uh, many questions, but later. Um, so um, you had your temperature from your Eli plus the Raman. Um, Eli seems to be lower, about like 200 degrees, compared with the 270 to 50. Um, so you mentioned Rocky Valve. So does a Rocky Valve T-Max confirm one or the other? Oh, gosh, sure. In my point of view, it would, it would confirm the, uh, the higher temperature. Yeah, I forgot to take that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Just for the benefit of everyone online, uh, Chris has just asked about uh, some of the variations between the uh, different temp temperature proxies and how that compares to things like T-Max and Rocky Valve. Yeah, no, sorry about that. Yeah, I completely forgot the back. The, the Rocky Vale side of things and um, off the top of my head, I mean, it's a little while since we've done this work. I've actually forgotten, but I can I can look that up for you. But you know, with the, the with the elite crystallinity, it's you know, as I said in the talk, it's not meant to be you know, dead on. You know, it's not going to give you within, you know, five or 10 degrees. It's kind of telling you this sort of, you know, it's been to really high temperature, essentially. Um, whereas the Raman, you know, as I understand it, the deconvolution is a little bit more accurate, but I think there's still plenty of you know, error associated with that as well. Um, but you know, everything that we saw, you know, obviously from um, equivalent vitronite reflectance, you know, 4.1 to 4.4, there was all all of that was telling us that, you know, um, um, you yeah, know, the material's seen a lot of heat and it's been down a long way, basically. So. Um, Uh, potentially, um, I, I actually think that this one, if I remember rightly, was done by Moose. So on the on the bitumen, and um, so he 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 has some you know whizzy conversions that he doesn't let anyone else see, and uh, which he took with him on his piece of paper when he left uh, <laughs> when he retired. So yeah. So I suppose that maturity on the Raman well potentially yeah yeah yeah. But i know moose had some reservations about that as well so we just ended up calling it bitumen 
So, well, I forget what they were. It's been a little while. But yeah. Is that a follow up, Chris? Or is oh, that yeah, just a final question, please? Um, with with the uh, Pongabini and the gold wire, so the samples you measured, obviously, there's some sort of differences. So, how does TOC affect the um, these sort of metrical measurements? Because so sort of Pongabini that we've analysed in our lab for TOC is up to forty percent, uh, like a like a kennel coral. Whereas gold wire never gets to that sort of mm. organic richness. So, how how does that that sort of So just a, another follow up from Chris. just a follow up question, Chris, on the effects of organic matter content on petrophysic properties. So okay, so in, in this one, in terms of the uh, the gold wire and bongabini, what we saw was you know exactly the opposite. But that's probably just a function of the samples we had and potentially where they were taken from in the basin. If I remember rightly, the bongabini that we had was quite low TSC, um, probably less than one percent. Um, so, you know, some of them were actually not all of them, but some of them were actually red shales. Um, so you might expect that um, anyway. Some were red, some were more more sort of dark green. Um, whereas the gold wire was maybe. You know, maybe about two percent, two point two, something like that. Um, and that was, or from what you, you saw a picture there with the particulate organic matter, and it, was, it seemed to be like that. Um, what we saw of it, so not particularly high in in this case. And I think in in that in that case there wasn't much effect of the organics, whereas the you know the Marcellus obviously was much more significant. Great. Um, we do have a question for online from uh, Lu Chi Wang. Um, first off, thank you, Dave, for a fantastic presentation um, and asked if you'd introduce the facilities in your lab for shale characterization. Um, oh, well, the chance for uh, uh, doing an advert, eh? <laughs> That's always good. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we've done a, a lot of shale characterization over the years, you know, be it from you know, things like XRD, um, you know, standard compositional stuff, um, you know, through to, you know, all, all the sorts of microstructural things that you've seen today. Um, you know, we do a lot of the, um, you've got sort of nano permeability rigs that can look at gas or water um, as your permeants. Um, you know, obviously, the geomechanics that we, we talked about there. So, yeah, I mean, we, we cover um, a lot of rock properties. There's a lot of um, um, what do you call them, petrophysical properties as well. Um, so things like dielectric properties. So you can look at dielectric constant, you can look at dielectric loss, you can look at conductivity, um, you can look at nuclear magnetic resonance, um, you know, things like that. We can combine that with fiber optics as well to look at deformation and fluid flow um, during core flooding, for example. Uh, maybe not as easy to do in shales, so thinking about it. Um, but yeah, so there's there's a whole range of, of different techniques that uh, you know, we can apply to this, and obviously organic petrology and things like that are all all in there still at the moment as well. So so yeah, I mean we we pretty much cover a large range um, of shell characterization. Right, to another another online one. Um, uh, great talk as always. You've got a fan, that's good. Um, did you check geothermometry on graptolite, etc., in comparison with the bitumen? Um, and any mismatch in diagenesis and thermal evolution on the organic matter and clays reported. And uh, greetings from Algeria. Um, so no, we did we didn't see any graptolites in this, as I recall. Um, off the top of my head, I'm just thinking maybe there was one um, off the top of my head, but uh, um, but yeah, not not enough to make um, a you know a. a scientific reasoning from if you like so i'm um, sorry what was the other bit um uh, organic matter and clays so the um yeah but you, you could say i mean chris sort of asked the, the question earlier about the yeah, the the elite uh, crystallinity was showing you know somewhere above 200 and the, the raman you know 250 plus so there, there's definitely a little bit of a mismatch there but again you know the elite crystallinity isn't an exact thing it's kind of a, a very broad uh, broad thing so um, you wouldn't necessarily expect the two to be exactly the same um, you know I, th I think there's it's just the the um the different strands of evidence that we pulled together from multiple different techniques um you know suggest that you know these things have gone down seven perhaps eight kilometers uh, maybe and that there is a you know a geological history behind that that uh, 
you know, we we weren't allowed to see everything from the company that uh, it's it had, unfortunately. But you know, there, there was obviously some more base and wide information there as well. So, I think I saw a hand there again from Chris Borum. Uh, you mentioned for the Marcellus, you had the spongy velocity when you're getting better. Uh, that's a, a good site for absorption of gas and things like this. Um, can you give us an indication that also we we actually see that for over mature organic matter in the Georgina and also the Barnett? Um, can you give us an idea of proportion between sort of you know, the pores or the organic pores that are available if in micro, meso, and nano velocity? Right, no. right, so hard one to summarise quickly, but a um, bit of a discussion around spongy porosity and its distribution between micro, meso and macro. Um, yeah, numerically, I don't, yeah, we, we didn't really sort of sit down and, and do those um, you know, characterisations, I would have to say. Um, we did have some pore size distribution information, if I remember correctly, which I, I didn't use here. And, you know, I think the, you know, you'd be looking at a peak um, sort of modal pore size of around 10 nanometers or something like that. Um, but we didn't, no, we didn't really divide them into those, the, the different categories, unfortunately. I mean, from, you, you could kind of see maybe from some of the images that, you know, you'd think that, you know, the pores there that were kind of like, you know, you know, above 50 nanometers, above 100 nanometers, maybe where the, there was a lot of them. Um, but, it, you know, in, so I'm talking there sort of more amount amongst the, the minerals side of things. Um, so that, yeah, those scale bars were in the microns, whereas when you looked at the, the organic matter, that was in the nanometer scale. Um, so obviously there, yeah, they were they were much smaller. But it would be quite hard to characterize that from the images, because once you you know you have the 200 nanometer scale bar, but some of those pores, you know, they're beginning to get a bit blurry and knowing exactly what the size was was a bit more difficult. So so no, we weren't able to, well, we didn't actually do that, didn't even think of it, to be honest. So sorry about that. So. A final question from Chris, apparently. Um, uh, just a comparison between uh, over mature coals and terrestrial organic matter. Uh, not, not in this particular study, we didn't. Um, I, I do have a feeling that maybe Moose and Zongshen did have a look at that, um, but I'm not sure that it went into this study. It might have gone into something else. So. Any further questions from the audience, either online or in person? Oh, well, I, I do actually have one. Um, Dave, obviously, you know, shales are uh, you know, a relatively hot topic at the moment, and uh, you know, the, the Marcellus and the Barkin and all the American ones for great comparisons, so data rich. Ours are obviously data poor. Have you guys thought about doing much more of this in terms of, uh, say, north, further into northern Australia, some of those proterozoic plays that are being proposed? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're certainly interested in doing that. We've been obviously doing a little bit with um, with you guys, in fact, on um, the South Nicholson recently um, in Carrara one. Um, also, we've done um, a couple of recent quite big reports on the Beetaloo. Um, I'm not sure if they're actually out yet. Um, I think the, I think Claudia or Faiz might have presented them at ages, perhaps. Um, um, the full reports might not be out, but there's quite a lot of information in those around sort of um, you know, diagenesis and other other rock properties. Um, now, ideally, what I'd like to do, um, I was hoping to have a an internal uh, strategic project running on the South Nicholson Basin this year to look at Carrara One and especially to look at sort of petrophysical properties and you know, all the the measurements you made around things like XRD organics, this, that, and the other. Um, and apply some, you know, AI machine learning type techniques to that. Um, unfortunately, our machine learning person was very busy this year, and we've not been able to do it. Um, so, but I'm going to try and get that going again next year, especially now that you've got, you know, all the shed loads of data out there. So there's probably more data there now than there would have been when we, you know, started off this project. So, great, thanks, Dave. Uh, oh, we've got two more questions, Evgeny. Uh, Dave, probably a related question. Has someone an idea of correlating uh, this the genetic and the uh, petrophysical uh, changes with the uh, trace element geochemistry? So just about correlating uh, these, these sort of work with trace element geochemistry. 
uh, yeah, we haven't done anything along those lines apart from a little tiny bit. Um, so I was, just gonna, I was about to say no, and then I just remembered that Claudia was doing a, a little bit of work um, looking at differences in uh, detrital quartz and orthogenic quartz, um, and he was doing some tough sims, I think, something along those lines, looking at, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily trace elements, but looking at things like aluminium um and titanium and things like that in quartz overgrowth compared to the detrital grains and and then the it's actually in the marsalis if i remember rightly um that uh, the the overgrowths had a you know, much more aluminium in them than the actual original detrital quartz so before i go back to chris i saw carol had his hand up as well before so uh carol here we go yeah, sure, thanks, so, thanks. so um I'm just wondering how much overlap is there between CSR energy work that you're doing on diagenesis and the mineral side of things like the Susanna Schmidt and others uh, in the mineral side? So just a quick one on overlap between work within CSRO energy and minerals. Uh, there has been you know, overlap in, in the past. I mean, Susanna used to work for us. Um, and then moved into the mineral side of things. Um, there are sort of various, um, what would you call them? Um, opportunities for us to do that at the moment. We're sort of you know, looking at things like you know, permanent carbon locking and things along those lines where you know, there's potential for you know, minerals and energy to, to overlap. There's not, I, would, I wouldn't say a huge amount going on, a little bit. Um, we actually probably did more in the past on geomechanical modeling and things like that than, than uh, the, the diagenetic end of things, although there are, you know, there's a certain overlap. And, you know, Suzanne did manage to poach our sedimentologist sequence stratigrapher quite recently, so uh, you know we've still got some good uh, um, contacts there, and you know potentially doors open. Um, so not the time bitter, <laughs> and I'm not really actually because we we couldn't offer Vince a job anyway, so <laughs> unfortunately. All right, probably time for one last one. I saw Chris put his hand up again, so. Oh yeah. Um, you presented a lot of techniques. And looking at force attraction and velocity. So, how do you decide sort of forces and courses? Obviously, it's a question that you, know, you want answered, but there's a broad range of techniques to do that. I mean, we've, we've had some work done with broad iron beam, um, SEM or TEM, whatever it is. So, but that wasn't mentioned here. So, um, yeah, so is there a a toolkit that you could down, or do you have to maybe talk to an expert? To, to um, so, great, great question from Chris. Actually, just picking of these many techniques and many others, which ones are to apply in certain situations? Yeah. So, uh, um, I should actually have said some of that was focused on iron beam stuff, but I just forgot to mention it at, at the time. Some, uh, yeah, where well, some of the SEM work was for sure. And um, in fact, the TEM foils are actually prepared like that with the with the uh, you know, you, you dig out one area and then you dig out another area behind it and then pluck out the TEM foil from, from in between. So that that's you know, that, that was actually used as part of that. I just didn't go into the detail. Yeah, I don't think that would have something like that. Yeah, it's really yeah. yeah. And yeah. So it's I mean the, the pore size, you know, visualization is very, very difficult, um, obviously as as you know, and the yeah, the sample prep is a, a big part of that. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of a toolkit, um, and it probably depends a little bit on the, the rock that comes in, um, you know, the questions that you're looking to answer. Um, you know, if it's very broad, then obviously you can chuck a, you know, a few things, a few standard things at it to start with. And then once you learn a bit of information, see where to go with it. Um, I wouldn't say there's a one size fits all approach. Um, you know, I've spent probably 30 years of my career trying to persuade people that shales are actually different. Um, and one, you know, one shale over here isn't the same as one shale over here. And you know, I think the gold wire and the bonga bini shale are a nice example of that. And you, even comparing those to the Marcellus, you see very different, you know, organic matter, for example, and what have you. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a, you know, you start somewhere and then, you know, see what's sensible to to move on with from there. I mean, obviously you'd love to do everything, but you can't always do that or afford it. So, much as we'd like to. All right, thanks heaps for that, Dave and, and Chris for all your very enlightening questions. Um, 
Well, that's that's probably all we have for today. Um, before I finish up, uh, I will point out that Dave is here for most of the rest of the day. Um, we'll be over in the cafe if anyone within the building uh, wants to have further discussions around ev everything. And um, you know, I've got some, some meetings around later that everyone's invited to that Kroll's kindly organised for us. Um, I will point out uh, as well that there's no scheduled seminar next week, um, but we do have uh, one on May 4th with a guest speaker, uh, Mariam Harmleder, sorry, apologies if I've mispronounced that, um, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne presenting on hydrogen production from geothermal energy. Uh, she'll outline how different geothermal based uh, routes for hydrogen production have been investigated to explore the possibility of producing clean hydrogen in the Australian geothermal context. So please join us again then and uh, please join me in thanking Dave for his uh, great talk today.